Okay, hello everyone. This is going to be my first feature-length commentary I've ever done. And what a movie to do with Raiders of the Lost Ark. And today marks the 40th anniversary of it being released. So this is going to be a lot of fun. So let's, uh, let's get started, shall we? If you want to watch along with me, put it on zero seconds and let's press... Let's press play on, I guess, <laughs> I used to watch movies with my friends over uh, Xbox Live and stuff. So we would do a countdown. I think I would do one, two, three now and then press it. So let's do that. Okay, you ready? One, two, three, now. All right, here we go. This is going to be fun. Yeah, Paramount logo. Yeah, uh, Steven Spielberg on The Making Of always talked about how he wanted to dissolve the Paramount logo into a real mountain. And so, yeah, he finally got to do that. I believe they are they are in Hawaii here on the island of Kauai, I believe. And if I'm not mistaken, this is where 11 years later they would film Jurassic Park. So, yeah, pretty cool how that works. <clears throat> So I just read the Raiders of the Lost Ark book and it goes into great detail about these guys, basically what's going on here. And so Indy hired these uh, Incan Indians. I guess they are Quechua or Kichu. I can't, yeah, Kichu, I think. And so he's using them as manual labor and guides and stuff. And uh, the two scumbags we see here, Satipo and Baranca, Baranka is the guy who is wearing the hat. He's the one that's going to try and shoot Indy in the back later. Basically, these two guys were hired by Belloc to find Forrestal. Forrestal is basically a contemporary of Indiana Jones. He's like an archaeologist. And uh, he's trying to find this temple so that they can find the fertility uh made out of gold you know the statue and whatever and so belloc hired these two scumbags to get the map from forestall and they were only able to recover one piece of it and so once they found it they basically said ah screw belloc we're gonna keep this for ourselves but they didn't have the other piece and i guess somehow indiana jones came into possession of the other piece and so they found out and presented them their services to Indy. And it always kind of surprised me. I was always like, why the hell would Indy work with these guys? And uh, that's why, because he had one piece, they had the other piece. He didn't really have a choice. And it was Alfred Molina as uh, Satipo. Javitos. I believe the Javitos might be a real tribe, but I think they're more like Amazonian uh, Indians. But, uh, yeah, this is supposed to take place, I think, in Peru. I mean, it says South America, 1936, eventually. Yeah, there we go. So, I don't know if Peru's really jungle. I mean, I've been to Peru, and it was very mountainous and very cold. So, I don't know. Maybe in the southern or northern part of Peru. I don't know. But, yeah, this is all Hawaii here, so... And so now Indy puts the two pieces of the map together and he was kind of waiting for, uh, yeah, because he knew these guys by reputation. These guys are killers. Yeah, those Baranca's giant Remington. <laughs> and Indy was wet. He was ready. Like that's, he heard the click and he was like, all right, now these guys are going to make the move and try to kill me. But yeah, there goes Baranca running away. And Baranka is kind of the, uh, he's kind of the snake, but Satipo, he's a, he's kind of the rat, you know, he's just kind of the sheepish guy, but he's also kind of a little bit smarter than Baranka, I guess. Uh, honestly, I don't even know why Indy kept Satipo around, I guess he was just like, all right, well, at least I'm not here alone. <laughs> and Satipo can carry this shit, I guess, so, Yeah. But Indy was ready. He knew these guys were cutthroats, and uh, he definitely was not going to be surprised by them. Yeah, here's Indy talking about Forrestal, I believe. 
Yeah, basically, I think Forrestal was a bit older and maybe a bit too much of an academic. And Indy was really like, all right, this guy shouldn't have even been out here. <clears throat> I believe they are on the studio at Elstree here in uh, England. I think Spielberg wanted to work on uh, Pinewood because that's where all the James Bond movies were made. But Lucas filmed on Elstree for... Uh, Star Wars, and he really liked it. So he talked Spielberg into filming at Elstree, and hey, you can't argue with the results. I mean, this, I mean, look at this. This looks great. Yeah, there's the uh, giant tarantulas. I don't think this would happen, but you never know. Tarantulas are pretty crazy, though. I mean, they're very poisonous. I don't know if they could kill you, but maybe if they bit you in the neck. Yeah, <laughs> this is Alfred Molina having a good time. Yeah, he talked about this scene in the uh, making of. He basically, they put the male spiders on him and they wouldn't move. And then the spider wrangler put a female on and that's when they went nuts. And uh, yeah, Alfred did not have a good time on that one. <laughs> now, I can't remember if Mythbusters did something with this because it's kind of crazy, like light. I mean, that can trigger a trap like this. And there's Forrestal. Poor bastard. In the book, uh, Indy was a bit nicer to Forrest All He actually pulled him off of there and laid him on the ground respectfully. But in the movie, uh, eh. <laughs> he's got better things to do. He's got this golden idol to go after. But, uh, yeah, close call for Satipo there. But, uh, yeah, let's see. It's kind of hard not to watch the movie. <laughs> But thankfully, I've seen this so many times. Yeah, this, uh, I mean, just look at the art design they did on this movie. I mean, this looks great. And uh, the director of photography, I mean, he did such a great job. But, like, look at that shadow. That is just amazing. Oh, there it is. And I believe this was, uh, the idol is based on a real, I can't remember if it was an Incan statue or something. Uh, it was basically a woman screaming her head off while giving birth. <laughs> kind of a kind of a pretty uh pretty hard to look at um <clears throat> statue. This is a pretty cool trick here. Yeah, good thing it didn't miss. <laughs> that thing had been like two inches to the left, two inches to the right. Eh. End of the movie. <clears throat> I'm kind of curious what a coward like Satipo would have done. Would he have gone for it or would he would he have gotten the hell out of there? <clears throat> Ooh. Yeah, this is just a masterful, masterful scene. The tension, the lighting. It's just brilliant, brilliant. Had to be pretty fun shooting here. I mean, look at this set, man. This is ah, amazing. The lighting, I mean, look at this. Harrison's acting. Yeah, I really, I really appreciate this movie now because when I was a kid, I kind of took this movie for granted. I mean, it was just always around. I mean, this came out six years before I was born. So it was just, you know, it was just always there. But you you have to think for like Generation X who saw this movie when they were like seven or 10 and stuff. I mean, this movie just had to be, holy shit. I mean, imagine seeing this in the theater as a kid. This would have been amazing. <clears throat> probably the only thing I can compare it to is maybe seeing uh, the Lord of the Rings in the theater. Like I was 14 when I saw Fellowship of the Ring on opening night and I was just, oh, <laughs> you better run, boy. <laughs> run, Indy, run. Yeah. Would be interesting to see if you could actually make a booby trap like that and have it actually work like 500 years later. Uh, adios, senor. <laughs> Bastard. Ooh. Now, naturally, the door here would have closed like 10 seconds before Indy would have gotten up there, but, you know. Gotta love movie making. Oh, my God. Imagine how terrifying this would be in real life, though. Like, holy shit, man. <laughs> like, I don't want to fall and die, and I don't want to be trapped in here. Go, 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 go. Yep. 
And poor Satipo, he forgot about the trap, of course. Yeah, that always kind of freaked me out as a kid. Adios, Satipo. All right, here comes a legendary boulder. Yep, this was made out of fiberglass, I believe. Yeah, that is just insane. <laughs> Uh, that had to have weighed. I can't remember. I think Vic Armstrong talked about it in his book. I think that had to have weighed like 100 pounds. I mean, you definitely don't want to get hit by that thing. I mean, it's a Havitos. Naturally, they're guarding the temple of their ancestors. So they will kill anybody who goes there. And Baranka probably got captured by him and told him where Indy was. So... And here we are introduced to Belloc. Ah, Renee Belloc. Played by Paul Freeman. It's kind of a shame Paul Freeman didn't have too much of a career after this. Really, I've only seen him in... Uh, he was in a Christopher Walken movie called Dogs of War. And uh, he actually met his wife on that movie. His wife is smoking hot in that movie. And uh, he actually came back after this to play a... Uh, character in the adventures of young indiana jones i can't remember who he played on that uh he actually played a real life guy let me see I'm on his wikipedia Let's see if they say <laughs> yeah i can't remember the name of his character yeah it was a great laugh by belloc <laughs> Uh, yeah, Frederick, uh, C. Los. Yeah, he was a marksman who fought in World War One and kind of a Bushman. So, yeah, it was really cool seeing him come back in, uh, the indie universe. And here we are introduced to Jock. I think Jock would show up again in the uh, Indiana Jones books and the comic books. It's kind of weird in the uh, novelization of the movie, he was actually a Scotsman, but here he's... Obviously American. Oh, God, look at that great shot. Yeah. And the cool thing is the uh, guy playing Jock in the movie is actually a real-life pilot. Like, um, interestingly enough, when uh, Spielberg was filming Jurassic Park here in Hawaii, they got slammed by a, uh, I don't know, is it technically not a hurricane? It's a typhoon. Yeah, because it's in the Pacific. So they actually got trapped in Hawaii and... Uh, the guy playing Jock actually never worked as an actor again. He just wanted to be a pilot. But Spielberg hired him to come and rescue them from Hawaii. So he had to fly a plane all the way to Hawaii and get the cast and crew out of there. So that was kind of cool. And there's the music. John Williams, can you imagine being in the studio and hearing this music for the very first time? Like, oh my God. Could anything be more perfect? <laughs> There's uh, Reggie. <laughs> to be fair, I don't think any of us would be happy having a freaking python climbing up our leg in a biplane. Or I guess this is more of a boat plane, biplane. Uh, beautiful Hawaiian sunset. What a great start, man. Perfect start to a perfect movie. Now, I can't remember which university this is. Hmm... I'm sure they said in the book, but I don't, I don't remember. But, um, yeah, we get to see Professor Jones here. <laughs> and uh, the chicks really dig him. <laughs> Interestingly enough, though, I believe most of the archaeologists in the world are women nowadays. Which makes sense because archaeology is very tedious meticulous and frankly to me boring <laughs> i know so many people have been inspired to become archaeologists because of the indiana jones movies but i mean <clears throat> you are literally moving inch by inch through the earth like everything has to be checked out everything i mean it's just oh my god yeah love you <laughs> So it's, uh, I can definitely understand why women would be interested in it. Because they, uh, they just seem to be more patient and meticulous than us men. 
we kind of want to kick doors down and use dynamite. <laughs> yeah, we want to get to the gold where, you know, conquistadors and stuff. Interestingly enough, in the book, the uh, lady with the uh, love you written on her eyelids, I believe, actually sleeps with <laughs> Indiana Jones. Yeah, like she goes to his house later on. So kind of, good boy, Indy. <clears throat> Probably shouldn't be doing that, but you know him. <laughs> now, this is 1936. I believe Indiana Jones is either 36 or 37 here. So he's getting up in the years. I guess it depends on if it's uh, early 36 because Indiana Jones' birthday is July 1st. So 1899. So <clears throat> <clears throat> sorry about that. Um... So yeah, here he is selling trinkets. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you ask a uh, modern archaeologist what they think of Indiana Jones, they really don't like him. They think he's a sort of tomb robber. Like, this is highly unethical. So, yeah. But, I mean, it's how it was done in the old days. And I have to say this is a lot more fun than modern day archaeology, but... Antiquities are very, it's a very dirty market nowadays. I mean, the black market is crazy and, you know, <clears throat> people are having to send stuff back to countries all the time. Like the Museum of the Bible up in D.C., they just had to send like 60,000 artifacts back to Iraq because they were acquired illegally and stuff. So, yeah. Now, in the book, these two army intelligent guys were actually in uniforms and very military-esque. But here, they're dressed much more like civilians. It's like, okay, guys. <clears throat> they're talking about Ravenwood and all that. And uh, I've heard a lot of people complain, saying that these guys should probably be British intelligence. Which I guess makes sense, because America, we really didn't have much of like a spy program or much of an intelligence, foreign intelligence thing going on. And, you know, England, they had MI6 and all that. So, yeah, these guys probably should have been British, especially considering how it involves Egypt and uh, all of that because of the Suez Canal and stuff. So, but I mean, American intelligence, yeah, man. Basically, we just needed somebody to hire Indiana Jones and fund his trip to uh, go and find Ravenwood. Yeah, and the acting here is really good between Harrison Ford and uh, Daniel Melliot. And uh, I can't remember. I think doesn't. I swear to God, I've heard somebody say the math equation on the chalkboard is some kind of math joke or something i can't remember there's something there's something funny about the uh equation on there but if there's anything in the world i am 100 percent ignorant with it is math so don't take my word for it this is a really nice auditorium I, i'm sure this had to be some yeah i doubt this was a set built this was probably some school in uh california or something where they filmed I really cannot, for the life of me, remember which university Jones was teaching at in this. Wish I had the book. I would go and look at that. I'm pretty sure it says in the book. It was probably, see now the book came out the same year as the movie. It was probably just some bullshit school they made up. Yeah. Yeah, they are talking about the Ark of the Covenant. Um, I really don't know that much about the Ark of the Covenant. Um, basically... I know it was made out of gold. It had angels on it. That's the winged creatures on it. And uh, it had the Ten Commandments on it. Now, as far as like all the theories and conspiracies, Templar Knights and the locations and all that, I, I never really bothered learning just because I mean, yeah. I mean, I'm more of a show me the evidence, show me the facts kind of guy like I'm not gonna be one of these conspiracy guys <clears throat> but basically 
If the Ark of the Covenant was in the Temple of Solomon, when the Romans sacked Jerusalem, I can't remember what year, like 77 B.C., not 77 B.C., 77 A.D., I believe it was 77 A.D., if it was still in the Temple of Solomon, then it's gone. Yeah, the Romans, when they sacked Jerusalem, they destroyed the temple, they took all the gold, they took everything. And that's actually, if you go to Rome, you can actually see on their triumphal columns and arches and everything, you can actually see like um, all of the menorahs and all these Jewish artifacts that they carried out of uh, Judea, and uh, basically they used the money they took from Jerusalem to build the Colosseum. So, yeah, if there was uh, if there was the Ark of the Covenant, they probably would have just broken it up and melted down the gold. In fact, it's kind of interesting to think the uh, if you have a gold wedding band on, or if you have gold fillings in your teeth, maybe you have a bit of the Ark of the Covenant on you right now. It's kind of crazy to think. But yeah, I love the uh, love the whole like kind of creepy mystery of the ark and you know all that. And a you know Brody talks about it leveling mountains and laying wastes and all that. And really, I don't recall there being such stories about the ark of the covenant. Really, it was just a it was just a artifact. It was really the holy of the holies. Basically, when it was. With the Israelites, when they were going around the desert and stuff, they used it to kind of help bring down the walls of Jericho. They carried it around the city, what was it, seven days? And they blasted horns and stuff, and that made the walls of Jericho collapse. So it wasn't really the Ark of the Covenant that did it. It was kind of the whole, the whole thing that did it. And uh, when they built the Temple of Solomon, it was kept inside, and I think only the highest priest was allowed to see it. And even when they were wandering the desert, you know, it was kept in a tabernacle, which was basically like a big tent. And even then, only the highest of priests could see it. And I really love this part with Denim Elliott talking about, you've never really gone after something like this, Cindy. Like, you know, you need to kind of respect this and don't be such a cowboy and uh the music and everything i mean this is just masterful filmmaking i really love this i mean i know every film is a collaboration but this movie i mean just you know spielberg was at the top of his game george lucas was kicking ass i mean he was even nice smith and wesson there <laughs> Yeah, Indy doesn't have his Webley yet. But, uh, yeah, I mean, just everybody was at the top of their game. I mean, um, George Lucas was even acting as the uh, second uh, unit director sometimes. And I love that hat. <laughs> oh, in fact, um, you can actually buy the official Indiana Jones hat. It was made at a... Shit, who made it? It was some company in London. Oh, yeah, there was the... Uh, <laughs> That was the, uh, I believe he was the head of uh, ILM at the time. Yeah, he was a legendary special effects guy. Yeah, let me uh, look that up because I know you can actually buy the real Indiana Jones hat. I love this. That's a beautiful shot of San Francisco. Can you imagine how much of a nightmare would have been flying across the Pacific back then? I mean, it takes 16 hours to get from California to, I don't know, Japan. Like, look at him. He's having to fly Hawaii, Philippines, and then up into Nepal. And uh, in the book, it goes into greater detail about how Indy got to Nepal because in the movie, they kind of make it look easy. But back then, no. <laughs> Basically, he landed in Nepal. And had to, he had a contact, a Chinese contact there who gave him a car. He, so he had to like drive up into the mountains in the snow at night. And uh, it was a real challenge getting there. And the only reason why he was able to find the place was because in the book they named the bar the Raven. So he was like, okay, Ravenwood, Raven, okay. 
I'll check it out. <laughs> and uh, yeah, here we are. And this is a this is a very actually a very dangerous place because like all the people in here are from everywhere. Like they have Nepalese people. Like that lady there is probably a native. But you got Mongolians. You got Chinese. You got Australians. You got Brits. You got drug runners like a thing in the book this guy who marion's going up against is uh i think he's like an australian drug runner or something you know basically they're running heroin and uh, opium up from afghanistan up into nepal because nepal is kind of a crossroads i mean you got china you got india you got afghanistan you got all those places so these guys are like basically drug runners you know they're getting the opium up out of Afghanistan over into China and uh, India and stuff. So, yeah, Marion's got herself surrounded by some uh, hardcore characters here. And uh, Indy did not have a fun time finding her. Yeah, I can't really find the place where to get the official Indiana Jones hat. I know that it's a place in London. So if you want to get your real Indiana Jones hat, go there. Because <laughs> uh, they changed up the company, I think, for Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. They had they hired some company from like Arkansas or something. But the real, the real Indiana Jones fedora is made by a company in England. I believe it's made out of rabbit leather. Now, my hat is made out of uh, wool, which is nice because it's crushable and you can just throw it in a suitcase and it'll pop back into shape, no problem. Now, the story between Marion and Indy is pretty interesting. Basically, according to the book and everything, they knew each other about 10 years before this. So Indy would have been 26, 27 probably would have been maybe post-grad and Marion would have only been like 16 or something so yeah we're not really sure what happened but let's just say it would have been unscrupulous nowadays <laughs> yeah we're not I mean no in Indy I mean if he sees a pretty girl he's going after it so you know I wouldn't be surprised if he uh, seduced her and you know what he says, you know, she's like, I was a child, I was in love. And he was like, ah, you knew what you were doing. It's kind of like, okay. <laughs> and there was uh, George Lucas who came up with this. And uh, I think Spielberg was a little like, okay, George. I mean, I know this is the 30s and the 20s, but. Uh... <laughs> and uh, seeing how there's all this news nowadays about, you know, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark turning 40 and. The film in Indiana Jones 5, you know, the, uh, they're kind of having to defend their relationship a little bit. Like uh, Karen Allen here, who's fabulous as Marion. I really love her in this. Uh, she's just kind of out there like, ah, Indy's not a pedophile. I mean, they would just, you know. <laughs> so I don't know. But like I said, knowing Indy, I mean... Basically, since he was like 16 or 17, he's really liked women. In fact, if you watch The Adventures of Young Indiana Jones, how he goes on his first big adventure by himself is he and his cousin are trying to go to a whorehouse in Mexico. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and they get like trapped by, he gets captured by Pancho Villa. So, yeah. I mean, Indy, uh, Indy likes the girls. There's the headpiece for the staff of our very beautiful. Imagine having that prop. Ah, uh, that'd be awesome. <laughs> and uh yeah, I mean it's their relationship's interesting, very interesting. You know, I don't even like thinking about the crystal kingdom of the crystal skull. Like I don't even want to think about that being canon, but I guess technically Marion is the one he ends up with. Yeah. Kind of interesting. Um, yeah, ah, here we go. We get to see Arnold Tote, or Tot. I never could figure out how to say his name. Played by the great Ronald Lacey. This guy is very creepy. <laughs> I 
And he should be. I mean, he's playing a Gestapo agent. The uh, Gestapo were scary, very scary. I mean, they tortured and killed thousands, maybe tens of thousands of people. Not really sure if they uh, were able to go around the world like this, but you know, I mean, this uh, this mission to find the Ark was very high up on uh, Hitler's list here because um, in the book it goes into detail about Belloc. He actually gets approached by Dietrich, and we'll see Dietrich later on. And uh, they actually bring him to uh, the Eagle's Nest, and Belloc actually gets a one-on-one -on -one interview with uh, Hitler and stuff. So, I mean, this is, yeah, this is big stuff. And, uh, yeah. And you really get to see in this scene just how much of a uh, sadist tote is. And, I mean, that's kind of the guy you want for this kind of job. Interrogation and torture and stuff. Yeah, I believe in the book, the big guy is like a Mongolian or something. Yeah. I guess the guy on the left is supposed to be Nepalese, but you can see with his fake eyelids that he's probably some British bloke. Can't do that anymore. But to be fair, there's so many Asian stuntmen nowadays, it's yeah, not a problem. And you can tell here Tote really, really wants to torture her. God, this would have been horrible. And poor Marion. I mean, Marion, in the book, it really goes into detail. Basically... Her father, Abner Ravenwood, who was one of the uh, uh, guys who really helped Indy become who he was, uh, he basically was traveling the world looking for the Ark and got trapped in an avalanche about two years before this and was killed. And Marion was left on her own. So in the book, it's kind of implied that she had to actually be a prostitute in this town. And then the owner of the bar here went insane and basically ran off into the snow. And Marion, uh, boom, there's some uh, PG <laughs> violence back in the day. Jesus. And uh, so, yeah, basically she took over the bar and has been doing whatever she can to, you know, survive, basically, get back to America. Uh, and uh, there's this big guy, Jesus. I think he was a local Nepalese guy in the book. And a lot of the guns you see in the scene are historically not accurate. Like uh, the German henchman there is wielding a MP40. And the problem with that is it's 1936. So machine pistol 40. It's not really going to exist yet. And... Uh, yeah, I love this. Teamwork, baby. <laughs> Can't tell what pistol that is. I don't know. I know Indy's using a, um, I believe he's using that Browning in this. You know, some kind of FN Browning or whatever. Which I think came out like 1935. <laughs> and again, uh, I think I could be crazy, but I think that part with Tote screaming, I think that's got to be an homage to Lon Chaney as the Phantom of the Opera, that silent uh, horror movie. I think, I could be crazy. And I think that was Lon Chaney, maybe it was Lon Chaney Jr. Yeah, uh, this, I'm thinking, this is great. Yeah, <laughs> I love the sound effects in this. Yeah, really great sound effects. Yeah, there's Marion using a C96, hell yeah. And uh, you'll see a couple of P-38s in this. And, of course, P-38 was not around yet. And there goes the Raven. <laughs> Quote the Raven. <laughs> I'm your goddamn partner. <laughs> yeah, I really love, uh, I really love Marion. I mean, she's kind of that classic old school ballsy chick who you can actually believe is tough, you know. It's not like nowadays where every female has to be masculine and just be a Mary Sue and stuff. God, can you imagine flying to Baghdad in 1936? God, that'd be like a totally different world back then. Oh, Cairo, Jesus. 
Ah, uh, John Meese Davies. Love that guy. And uh, yeah, the book goes into great detail about Sala's family. He's got like nine children and his wife is very nice. It's kind of crazy when they had to film this, they had to take down all the uh, antennas because <laughs> everybody was watching TV by this time. And I uh, believe this was filmed in Tunisia because trying to film in uh, Egypt is, yeah, good luck with that. Yeah, Carrie, and, uh, Carrie Allen did not enjoy working with this monkey. Basically, it was untrained and just, yeah. <laughs> basically, you had to get it at a good time. Yeah, basically, just film it at a good time. But, um, yeah, I mean, this is a... This is just classic old school filmmaking, man. We're never going to see this kind of movie ever again. Because Spielberg had kind of built up a reputation by this time of taking forever to make a movie. And he's going over, he's going over budget and everything. And he really wanted to come in under budget for this. He wanted to be on time and... The cool thing about that is he challenged himself, he pushed himself, and, you know, they would take shortcuts, they would shoot on the fly, and I think it really, really helps this movie, especially the action scenes that we're about to see. But then with, like, set pieces like this, I mean, the scenes are so well shot, and the actors are so great, like, I mean, John Reese davies here talking about the Ark of the Covenant, I mean, he's like, it is not of this earth. You know, it's was not meant to be disturbed. I mean, he's just so great. I mean, all these actors just really, I think, enjoyed this. And uh, and it probably helps that a lot of them grew up on these kind of uh, movies, these action adventure movies, serials as they like to call them. So, the, you know, they knew the genre and they grew up reading the adventure books and I mean, guys like this pretty much really existed. I mean, the guys who were working for the natural history museums around the world, I mean, these guys would literally just get a couple of hundred bucks in their pocket, put a gun in their pocket, and go off and fly around the world and try to find artifacts. You know, try to find lost worlds, try to find dinosaur bones. I mean, these guys were freaking hardcore badasses. I mean, you look at traveling around the world nowadays and how difficult it is. That's... It was a hundred times harder back then. I mean, you had all these diseases you had to worry about. I mean, basically every single actor and crewman, except for Spielberg in this movie, got sick making this movie because they were eating the food. Oh, uh, <laughs> there's the actor who played uh, Veronica. Yeah, I can't remember his name. Vic uh, Tal Tablin or something. Yeah, he actually gets to play two guys in this movie. And interestingly enough about Vic Tablin, uh, he would come back later on um, The Adventures of Young Indiana Jones. I feel like I'm going to call it The Adventures of Young Hercules at one point. <laughs> but yeah, The Adventures of uh, Young Indiana Jones, he would actually play Demetrius, who was uh, like a digger in Egypt who actually almost killed Indiana Jones as a child and Ended up getting captured by T.E. Lawrence and stuff. And I think uh, technically he may be the first guy that Indiana Jones ever killed. I don't think he like killed him like with a gun or anything. But he like left him in a building that was that blew up. It was like full of munitions and stuff. And uh, that was kind of technically, I guess, the first man that Indiana Jones ever killed. I guess he would have been like 16 or 17 at the time. So... That's pretty cool. Vic, uh, Vic got to play three characters in the Indiana Jones universe. Now, here we go with a great action scene. Yeah, the music is perfect. I just love this. And you could tell this was just, oh, this just looks hard filming. <laughs> I mean, you're just bouncing around. These poor stuntmen having to wear the uh, uh, schmogs and khalifas on their faces. I mean, just, oh my God. I mean, just bouncing around a little bit, you're going to be sweating your ass off. It's probably like 115 degrees or 45 degrees Celsius. I mean, it's just, <clears throat> I mean, oh my God. <laughs> and no telling how many takes you had to do. And here's Harrison showing off his whip skills. I believe, I can't remember who trained him, but um, I can't remember the guy's name, but he's like a really cool stuntman. 
Yeah. Um, <clears throat> he, uh, I remember he played a guy named Blade in Masters of the Universe, and he was also in the beginning of the movie uh, Fearless, the Jet Li movie. He was the guy using the uh, rapier or whatever against Jet Li. So the guy's a really cool guy. And here we go. Yeah, Marion's just like, all right. <laughs> yeah, she's a tough bud. And you believe it. I mean, this woman's had to survive in Nepal for God knows how many years. I mean, she's tough. It's not like nowadays where they just say, oh, you know, the woman's a stuff because, or they make her masculine. Like, Marion's a woman, you know. She's feminine, but she's tough. Ballsy, you know. So, it's just a shame they don't write women like that anymore. Like, a woman can be a woman and tough. She doesn't have to have masculine, you know. <sighs> and that damn monkey. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, this just looks uh, so hard to shoot. I mean, Harrison was just so sick here. And here we go, one of the most legendary <laughs> scenes ever. Yeah, I can't remember which uh, stuntman that is. Uh, I don't... Yeah, I think it was Terry Leonard. Ones. Yeah, I think that was Terry Leonard. He would go on to be a stuntman in some great movies like Conan the Barbarian and stuff. And uh, naturally, the reason why they did that instead of having a big drawn-out fight was just... I think they thought it would just be funny and uh, Harrison was so sick and stuff. They just wanted to get done that day, pretty much. So... Yeah, lots of cats in the Middle East. You gotta kill those rats. This is a nice close-up of Harrison. He's just like, ah, shit. <laughs> Where do I start? Ah, fuck it. Let me just <laughs> get them all. This would be, like, imagine being Indiana Jones here. Like, this would be terrifying. People are trying to kill you. You don't know what the hell. Now Marion's been kidnapped. I mean, this is a very dangerous city. Like in the book, this scene was pretty, pretty brutal. Like, especially this part, because there's like, this is like where all the crippled people are and the beggars and stuff. And Indy's just having to run around these guys and they're just like dying, starving to death. Like, yeah, right here. I mean, these guys are like missing limbs. They were born with birth defects and stuff and they're just dying and just begging for food begging for money anything it's a nice yeah i love that just badass man now this looks kind of bad but <laughs> when you blow up a truck it's very dangerous i mean shrapnel is flying everywhere so you kind of have to give them a break here putting it out in the middle of nowhere all of a sudden <laughs> yeah what happened to all the people in the uh, alley they were in but you know like, I remember listening to the commentary, I believe, on... It was the second Rambo movie, First Blood Part 2. And uh, it was the part where Stallone was shooting the explosive arrows at trucks and stuff on the bridge or something. And they were shooting this from, like, I don't know, like 500 feet away. And somebody standing behind Stallone, like one of the crew members, actually got hit by a piece of shrapnel and had to get, like, 50 stitches, like... There, by the you know, there by the grace of God goes I. Pretty much, like I mean, blowing up a truck is blowing up a truck. So, bits of metal and everything's going everywhere. So, you got to be very, very safe. And yeah, and this is old school filmmaking too. So I mean, that's not really all that safe. <laughs> I mean, the fire stunts and stuff are. Eh. And we go with Belloc again. This is a great scene between the two of them. You get the classic, uh, oh, you and I are the same kind of thing. And, uh, yeah, Paul Freeman just does such a great job in this. I don't know why he didn't have a bigger career. I mean, he's a he's a really good actor. And the cool thing about Belloc and Indy is they've known each other for a long time. Basically, I guess the official time that they met would have been in graduate school, I believe. Because Indy went to the University of Chicago for for um, archaeology, but I think he went to either graduate school or postgraduate school at the uh, Le Sabon in Paris. And uh, I believe that's when he and Belloc would have met each other. Belloc's a couple of years older. Like, I think Belloc's about 40 here, give or take. 
So, uh, and uh, basically, Belloc has always been Indiana Jones' uh, foible. Or foil, I mean, yeah. Like, whatever, like, basically, that's how they became enemies, was in graduate school, basically. Indiana Jones found this, I believe it was a cave site that had a bunch of stuff in it, and Belloc beat him to it. And just, you know, Belloc is just always one step ahead of Indy. And if you think about it, at the end of the movie, I mean, Belloc kind of wins. I mean, he gets the arc. He, you know, he has all the cards. If it wasn't for God, <laughs> Belloc would have won. I mean, it's Belloc is really the winner. I mean, he's just always outdoing Indiana Jones. And, you know, this is a really interesting conversation about archaeology here. Like, you know, I mean, we're not exactly ethical archaeologists here. You know, we've kind of strayed from the truth faith here. Yeah. And Indy doesn't really want to admit it, but I think deep down he's like, yeah, I kind of don't do things by the book here. <laughs> Which, I mean, eh. That's the great thing about Indiana Jones. I mean, he's not a goody two shoes. He's not perfect. But in the end he's a good guy and we vote for him. Oof. <laughs> it's a lot of firepower. So yeah, basically Belloc was just trying to piss Indy off so that he would lose his temper and they could kill him. Yeah. I mean I don't even really know what Belloc was wanting to do there other than kill Indy. I don't know why he just wouldn't shoot him. Yeah. Um, but in the book, he's kind of like, you know what? I'm kind of glad I didn't have to kill Indiana Jones there. I kind of want him to suffer. I kind of want him to see me get the arc before him. So he was actually a little happy there. But good thinking on Sala's part, sending his nine kids in there. Yeah. These guys are just laughing their asses off. But, uh, yeah, I mean, and, uh, John Reese Davies, I believe, is kind of from Africa. Like, I think he was born there or he was raised there. I can't remember. His father was, I don't know, like a soldier or a diplomat or something. And uh, Africa is a rough place, man. Northern Africa, I mean, like, they still have slavery there. I mean, I remember watching an interview with John Reese Davies talking about how his father was talking to him and they were like in the harbor or something and his father pointed at a ship and said, you see that, son? That's a slave ship. It's full of slaves being shipped off to Libya or somewhere. And he looked at his son and said, it's going to be up to your generation to end that. And unfortunately, slavery is still around. I mean, it's just as rampant as it ever was. I think there's actually more slaves in the world right now than there ever was at any other time in history. Yeah. So... I kind of want to try dates after watching this movie. I don't think I've ever had one. I think I'm more of a fig guy, but I'll see about dates. Of course, I'm going to try not to let them be poisoned. <laughs> okay, this uh, this imam, or whoever he is, has like the coolest freaking house in Cairo. I mean, look at this. He's got a telescope. He's got all these lamps. He's got a beautiful view. Again, I guess this is an Elstree. There's some set they built. And just look at all this. This is beautiful. All the glassware, the lanterns. I mean, I guess they probably went to like some antique <laughs> part of London or maybe India, little India or something and got all this stuff. No, oh, here's the poor monkey. I swear to God, this type of monkey was in so many freaking movies in the 80s. Like, wasn't there like a movie, little, what the fuck was it called? It was like a Pippi Long stocking movie. I think there was a freaking monkey like that in it. Now I'm not sure what language the headpiece is in. I don't even I don't even think it's said in the book, unfortunately. Yeah, like uh eh. I mean it should be in hieroglyphics, but you know. Demotic or uh Hell, I can't even remember all the different kinds of uh erratic and demotic script or whatever. Yeah. But then they wouldn't have needed the translator because Indiana Jones and Belloc speak, uh, understand hieroglyphs. So, this is a great moment here when they realize he's digging in the wrong place. <laughs> I 
and digging in the wrong place. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Close call here, Andy. Close call. Oh, poor little monkey. Bad dates. It's always made me sad. Because that was probably not a nice death. <laughs> yeah, poisons. Eh. And this is just a great shot. Like nowadays, this would just be CGI. And it's just... You know, wouldn't have the weight to it, wouldn't have the dust, wouldn't have the heat. I mean, you could fucking make this movie on a sound stage in Quebec or something, you know. This wouldn't look good. And I wish movies were made this way nowadays. Yeah, I think it's got to cost about the same. I mean, maybe even cheaper filming it like this. And uh, Spielberg did so much pre-production on this movie. I mean, they had so many... Uh, um, uh, just, uh, what's it called? Storyboards for this movie. I mean, hell, they even got Indiana Jones's costume from storyboards. I think it was just a storyboard artist had him in the fedora and the leather jacket. And they just were like, all right, that looks pretty good. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and, uh, they actually built a model of this area, like the sand dunes and stuff for, uh, um, Spielberg to actually, like, um, put, like, little, uh, toy soldiers and stuff so that he could kind of see where he wants to put the camera and stuff. So, yeah, I mean, they did so much work on this movie. And, uh, here's the map room. This is probably one of the best parts of the movie, I think. Just the, just how it looks and the music that, uh, I can't remember the name of the song. It's like the, um, arc theme, I guess. And I'm going to assume this was on Elstree Studio too. I mean, just look at this. Beautiful. Had to be fun getting all of that, uh, getting all of that uh, sand in there and out of there. And I love this, uh, I, I don't even know what to call it, I guess map, but it's like a diorama or something. Yeah, I just love that. You know that that's got to be in somebody's collection somewhere. I hope to God they didn't destroy that. Like that should be in a museum. Like they've, yeah, that's just so wonderful. Yeah, Sala gets in trouble here, and there's a deleted scene of uh, Sala actually being put up against a tree and about to be shot, but he shit his pants because <laughs> all the actors were sick in the movie. Now, in the book, it goes into detail about these holes. Like, in the movie, I always assumed, like, oh, that was just to uh, trick people. Like, oh, let's just have so many holes so they can't tell which one to put it in. But actually, in the book, Indiana Jones is able to read the hieroglyphs. And it actually tells you, no, each hole is for different times of the year. Because the sun's not always going to be in the exact same place. So, yeah, basically, Indy would have to know you know, what's the Egyptian calendar pretty much like, all right, so what day of the year is this hole going to be on or whatever, or what week of the year? So, yeah, <laughs> he's got to find the right spot. Oh, and I was looking for who makes the uh, official original Indiana Jones hat and it was made by Herbert Johnson Hatters in London so there you go if I recall correctly if you want your own it costs about I want to say 300 quid 350 pounds something like that so definitely worth a purchase if you want one look at that Matt I, ah, I love that like imagine having this in your house and so many people own the props and stuff from this movie like like all the guns are in private collections. I'm sure the headpieces, they probably made 20 of those, but I'm sure. I wonder if Harrison Ford, I mean, you got to think he's got so much of this stuff, the uh, costume at least, yeah. And, uh, yeah, that's so fucking cool. Now, in the movie here, this was always kind of weird to me. I was always like, why the hell does it glow? Like it like when this when the light hits it, like, whoosh, yeah, like <laughs> I was always like, 
Okay, is this magic? Like, what's going on? But in the book, it actually tells you that they must have built that model specifically to show, like, yeah, dumbass, this is where the arc is, so that you really don't miss it. They must have built it out of, like, some kind of crystal or something so that it would light up, basically. So that's why it does that. And uh, there's Indy putting his... Uh, cartography skills to use basically measuring it out and I guess like every inch is like 10 meters or something yeah uh, eh, nice thinking Sala <laughs> and uh, yeah basically interestingly enough the costume for Indiana Jones was probably inspired by Charlton Heston I want to say I don't know officially but Basically, Charlton Heston had the exact same outfit as Indiana Jones in two movies. One, I think it was, um, yeah, here we are where we find out Marion's still alive. Thank God. Um, one movie was, I think it was The Greatest Show on Earth, where Charlton Heston plays the ringleader of like a Barnum and Bailey circus. He has the brown fedora and the brown leather jacket. And another movie was much more closer to this movie. It was called The Secret of the Incas, I believe. It was actually filmed at Machu Picchu, and uh, Charlton Heston's character was kind of, he was kind of interesting in that movie. He was like this kind of scummy tour guide, basically, who, because you have to remember, Peru was pretty, pretty out there. 60 years ago <laughs> like there wasn't much uh tourism going on in peru back then so basically charlton Heston played this kind of dropout archaeologist who thought had this like crazy idea that there was buried treasure at machu picchu but he could never prove it and stuff and so he acted as a tour guide because he was you know he had to make a living while he was down there and he'd basically like take wealthy women up there and seduce them and stuff and yeah, it was a very it was a very interesting movie. I don't know if it's easy to come by. I watched the uh, yeah, there's the obelisk from the map and uh uh basically I watched it on Amazon like five years ago and it might be on YouTube, so if you want to check it out, because that could definitely be like the origins of Indiana Jones was Charlton Heston in that movie, and again he had the brown fedora and the uh leather jacket. I was always kind of curious about cartography, this kind of but again, I suck at math, so uh, yeah. I guess Indy's like, all right, for every inch on the uh, tape measure, it's like 10 meters or whatever. So he's just kind of having to figure that out. Now, here we are introduced to uh, Dietrich, the guy on the right, played by Wolf Collar, I want to say. This guy's been in so many freaking great movies. He always plays a... German officer <laughs> yeah he's been typecast so badly but he can't complain I mean he's been in some of the best movies ever made he was in this he was in uh, Barry Lyndon about five years before this or six years before this I think he played like a Prussian prince in that or something and uh what else was he he was in a pretty good scene in Band of Brothers I mean he's just been in so many freaking movies yeah you got to be freaking pres very precise with cartography. Because, I mean, imagine if Indy was like 20 feet off. They never would have found the Well of Souls. So, yeah, you got to be, you got to hope that map room was accurate. And you got to hope your calculations are accurate. Yeah. Would be into it. I mean, you could take a class on cartography. Like, you see these guys all the time with their... Uh, tools and stuff and i mean this is how you map the world pretty much guys just went around the world with that equipment and were able to tell where they are in the latitude and longitude and all that and yeah it was a great shot and just god i know they're filming indiana jones 5 right now and i have like after watching the crystal skull i have no faith that it's going to be a good movie but i don't know it, but whatever it is it's not going to be this yeah because the first three indiana jones movies are just yeah i mean it's arguably one of the best trilogies of all time definitely
Imagine how exciting this would be, finding someone. And they keep finding stuff in Egypt, man. I mean, they are finding stuff all the time. Now, another thing about the British intelligence, you kind of have to suspend some disbelief here because, I mean, this is a lot of Nazi soldiers here in Egypt. I don't think the British would have let that many Nazis anywhere near the Suez Canal. So, you know, to kind of think that, yeah, these Nazis could be here doing this, eh, probably not, but, yeah. Yeah, there we go, the Well of Souls. I can't tell if this statue here is supposed to be Anubis or Set. I don't know, I'd have to ask the production designer, I guess. Because Anubis, I've never seen like a pissed off Anubis before, so yeah. Maybe it could be set the who is the uh, god of war, so yeah. Jesus, yeah, this had to be fun to shoot. <laughs> they had to get like, I don't even remember, 5,000, 7,000 snakes, something like that. Yeah, it's crazy. And I think most of these are just garden snakes or whatever. Yeah. Now in real life, would there be that many snakes there? I mean, why would they be there? There's no food. There's like not even any water. So I don't know. But it's great for this kind of movie. Asp. Very dangerous. You go first. <laughs> I love that. And John Reese Davies always gets asked to do that. Yeah. If I ever meet him, I'll probably have him do that too. Or ask him, hey, can you please, please? <laughs> now, these two, um, Gary Allen and uh, um, Paul Freeman here, had a pretty good time doing this because there was basically just the two of them ab libbing. Like, Spielberg was just like, all right, you two. Yeah, figure out the scene. And in the book, it's kind of crazy because these two like really liked each other in the book. <laughs> like she was very attracted to Belloc. You know, he's a suave, intelligent guy and, you know, a Frenchman, of course. So, ooh la la. <laughs> and he was just like, ah, oh, she's pretty. Of course, he probably hasn't seen a beautiful woman in like six months. So, who knows? Yeah, what's going through his mind? And the funny thing is Spielberg basically had them come up with this because they wanted her to be in the dress, but they didn't know how to get her into the dress. So he let them figure it out. And basically they figured out, all right, she'll put the dress on and use her dirty clothes to grab the knife with. So they were able to come up with that. <laughs> Yeah, he's like, yeah, it's really been a long time since I've seen a beautiful woman. <laughs> I always wondered what kind of booze this was, because I'm like, it's supposed to be some kind of French, because it's made by uh, Belloc's family, who have a vineyard or whatever. And I'm like, it looks like vodka. I don't know what's going to be that clear. Like, see, yeah, there she goes using her dirty clothes. That was a beautiful dress. Yeah. Had to be probably very expensive, but that's the thing. Belloc's family, like, is very, very well off. I mean, he's an aristocrat. Yeah. Pretty much. That's probably one reason. Another reason why he kind of then doesn't like Indiana Jones. I kind of feel like he has that, just that superiority thing going on. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of funny. Ooh, God, yeah, this. Now you can kind of see the uh, you can kind of see the uh, plastic they used, but I don't care. I mean, that is just such a beautiful shot. Yeah, I mean, just look at that. That's a real fucking king cobra. That's a real cobra right there. And that is really reacting to Harrison Ford. Yeah, like it's really staring at Harrison Ford. <laughs> As a real King Cobra. Nowadays, it would just be some stupid looking CGI snake. 
But yeah. Yeah, I mean, they kind of had fun, you know, doing this part, but they said when the Cobras were bought on set, that's when everybody was like, okay, yeah. Everybody got serious that day when the Cobras were bought. And I'm sure the Cobras were milked for uh, the prior, you know, milked of their venom. So, you know, technically that would make them safer. But, I mean, you don't want to take that chance. I'm not sure how much... Uh, cobra anti-venom they have in london hospitals but you would basically have to get it within like 15 minutes see yeah i don't know what kind of booze that is i mean i guess it's like really really white wine i guess i don't know i don't know it kind of looks dark in the glass except hers yeah she's like all right come on i'm your huckleberry <laughs> he's like all right fine so basically, Bella can drink, but he doesn't really like to, I guess. <laughs> like, he can hold his own with her, but he doesn't want to. Yeah, this entire scene is... God, I love this fucking movie, man. <laughs> it's really funny because when I was a kid, I really just took this movie for granted. I, I just, you know, I if it was on TV, I would watch it. Or if I was in the mood, I would watch it. You know, it just was always there. It wasn't really until a couple of years ago. Yeah, I went like, I don't know, 10 years without watching it. And then I got in the Indiana Jones mood about four or five years ago. And I just sat down and watched it. And uh, I was just like, man, this is a really freaking good movie. Because, I mean, if you listen to anybody from Generation X, this movie was like, holy shit to them. And I understand it. I mean, it's just uh, being a little kid seeing this in the movie theater. Oh, my God. Yeah. <clears throat> Probably the Indiana Jones movie I grew up most with was Last Crusade. And that's my favorite Indiana Jones movie. This may sound weird, but I consider Raiders of the Lost Ark a better movie. But I like The Last Crusade more, if that makes any sense. <laughs> yeah, if you understand me. Okay, I don't know if you guys would have been able to pick that up. That would have been like solid granite. That probably would have weighed like two, 300 pounds. But, um, I mean, I love this movie, yeah. And here she is, like, Jesus Christ, what is this stuff, Renee? <laughs> He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, this is, you know, my family makes this. I pretty much grew up on this. Yeah, as a small boy, I didn't drink water, I drank this. <laughs> so she actually met her match, which I guess could be another reason why she likes him, because, you know, drunk her under the table. Not really sure what her plan was here. I mean, she would still have to, you know, walk three. He said the desert's three weeks in either direction, which, I mean, I mean, where the hell are we, the Sudan? <laughs> but, yeah, I mean. But, yeah, I mean, this is a, such a great movie. I mean, just everything came together, man. The actors, the music. I mean, it's got one of the best music scores of all time, just by chance. Yeah, you know. <laughs> just that little thing and the special effects i mean ilm was just knocking it out of the park i mean they had just done star wars and everything you know it's kind of weird to think that this actually came out before the last star wars movie did like this came out two years before um return of the jedi yeah it's kind of weird to think that yeah this was a <laughs> Great Spielberg gag. <laughs> I find that people either fall for it, they're like, <gasps> and then they're like kind of pissed off, like, oh, come on. <laughs> or they just find it freaking hilarious. Oh, yeah. What shall we talk about? He was so great in this. Um, yeah, my mom, oh my God, every time I watch this with her, she's always like, <gasps> <laughs> then she feels like such a dumbass when it's just a coat hanger. I mean, it's like, it always makes me laugh my ass off. Ah, there it is. Yeah. It would be amazing seeing the real arc if it's still around. That would be pretty cool. Uh, again, I don't know if they would be able to pick that up. I mean, I guess it's it's probably gilded gold or gilded gilded. So it's, I guess it's made out of a special kind of holy wood. I can't remember what kind of wood actually. And then they would have just uh, gilded the gold on. So 
It's probably pretty heavy, though, I would think. They would probably have a hard time. I mean, John Meese Savies is a big boy, and Harrison's in good shape, so I guess they would be okay. But, uh, yeah, I mean, then they brought along a crate for someone. <laughs> yeah, I don't know who thought that far ahead. Yeah, let's have a crate. Got some, uh, got a hammer and nails. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I just, I just can't see the arc being still around or being undiscovered. I mean, that's just, I just, I don't know. Maybe I'm too much of a cynic nowadays because life has disappointed me so many times. <laughs> but I don't know. I just feel like basically once Christianity became the religion of the Roman Empire, basically anything New Testament, Old Testament became like, you got to get this. Um, I mean, Constantine, the great's mother, I believe her name's St. Helena. I mean, she went to the Holy Land and just looked around for everything relating to Jesus. Like she supposedly found the true cross, the nails. I think she even found the wreath of uh, the crown of thorns. I mean, she just went and looked everywhere. So I feel like if the Ark was around, it probably would have been found. And, you know, there's the conspiracies. Oh, the Templar Knights or the Knights Templar have it somewhere and stuff. But I feel like it would have been long gone before they showed up. Because, I mean, they didn't show up until like 900. Well, let me think. I don't think they showed up until about 800 years after Constantine. So, eh. Belloc is such a dickhead here. <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Maybe even a thousand years you will be worth something. Yeah, son of a bitch. <laughs> I love that. And Dietrich is a bit of an asshole too. Oh, even uh, Belloc hates Dietrich. Yeah. And Toad, of course, wants to get revenge on her for his hand, even though he was the dumbass. Don't envy that stunt woman. I love this so much. She's like, fuck you, Andy. Look at me. Look at me. Yeah. And then she's like, ah. like that Cobra right there. That Cobra is reacting to her. Look, it even jumps right there. I mean, you can't. I mean, that's a, that's real. That's tangible. I mean, <laughs> she's, yeah, she was so fantastic in this movie. I know a lot of people kind of give her shit for coming back in uh, Crystal Skull. Like they just... Like, even Red Letter Media is, like, giving her shit, like, oh, she can go back to her job as a toll booth collector and stuff. I'm like, be nice. She was a good actress. And she was really good in this movie. Um, yeah, the cast for this movie was almost very, very different. Like, we all know that Tom Selleck was basically going to be Indiana Jones, but then he got locked into his, um, he got locked into his contract to do Magnum PI, which worked out for him. I mean, that was like one of the biggest TV shows of the eighties, but you know, I think Tom Selleck would have been a good Indiana Jones. I mean, he's a good, yeah, I love Tom Selleck. Um, I don't think a lot of the humor would have been as good. Like Harrison, like the, right there where he's like making fun of her. Like, where did you get the stress from him? You know, that kind of the, the stuff that Lawrence Kasdan added. Because I think he brought a lot of the humor to the script and stuff. Like um, Tom Selleck, I think would have been, he would have been pretty good. But he basically would have just been, you know, Magnum P.I. in the Indiana Jones outfit. So, but he would have been good. And he looks like he's from the 30s. I mean, with that stash. Yeah. And it would have been kind of tough finding guys to fight him because Tom Selleck's a big guy. Like, he's like six foot four, six foot five. I mean, it was kind of like the same problem they had with Arnold Schwarzenegger and Conan the Barbarian. Like, where the hell did we get guys who looked like they could actually beat him? Because, <laughs> you know, Arnold was in such great shape. I mean, so basically what they did was they went out and got like a six foot eight guy and a six foot ten former Raiders football player <laughs> to be the main... Uh, 
villains against them in the movie. So, yeah, trying to get guys to fight Tom Selleck would have been kind of tricky. Yeah. Great shot there. Yeah, and Indy, I mean, he's kind of like, this would be terrifying to do in real life. I mean, you are falling, man. That's like a 30-foot drop there. So that's not going to be fun. And this is probably the scariest moment in the uh, movie. Yeah, this is like, imagine the happened. <laughs> imagine this happening to you. And she did not enjoy this at all. Like, she actually preferred the snakes to this scene just because... Well, I mean, it's like being a horror movie actress. You have to uh, just scream all day and just, ah, 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 you know. It's not fun. Not fun. Well, and they basically, like, dropped her in a pit. Like, all the camera guys are up above her, and just they basically just kind of lowered the camera down and stuff. So, yeah, I mean, she was just, like, down there by herself, like, having to deal with all this. Like, ah, and this. <laughs> Got to talk to that special effects guy. Let's just have a snake going through the mouth of a mummy. Now, I don't think it was too uncommon for the builders of the tomb to be built kind of nearby, but I don't think they would have actually been buried inside. Yeah. And I always thought, well, if they'd only used the back door, <laughs> that would have been a lot easier than digging. But, yeah, who would have known? All right, here's one of the... I mean, the the pacing of this movie is just so fucking amazing. Like, we just go from one great scene to the next. I mean, it's just... Ugh. I just love this. Now, I think the Nazis were, at some point, designing a wing aircraft. <clears throat> I can't remember. Maybe it was, like, 1944 or something. Something kind of like this. And I think America was doing the same thing. It was, a, it was an interesting concept. I mean, I guess it's on a very mobile aircraft, but it would fly well, I guess. Like, especially over long distances. But, uh, yeah, this is a pretty, this is a pretty cool design of an aircraft. I don't think it would ever fly. <laughs> First of all, it looks way too heavy. Like, it's got all these machine guns and stuff. <clears throat> yeah, good fight here. Oh, yeah, Pat Roach, motherfucker. This guy is awesome. You can't really see it here, but if you look at his left arm, like where the bicep connects to the shoulder, he's got like a huge scar. And I noticed that he was in the movie Barry Lyndon. And uh, he was, uh, oddly enough, in a fist fight in that movie. And you could really see it. Like he must have torn the hell out of his left arm. Like, his bicep is, like, barely attached to his left arm, it looks like. Like, see that right there? Yeah. I mean, it was just a woof. But, yeah, Pat Roach, man, he was awesome. He was really, really good in this. And he was also the big bad Indian guy in uh, Temple of Doom that Indy had to fight. He was, like, the uh, Sikh guy. Oof. <laughs> That's such good acting there. Like, yep, yeah, that's a bell she wrote there. He's like, oh, come on, man. But, yeah, Indy's going to fight dirty. I mean. And he's going to run away. <laughs> yeah, the pilot's using a P-38 pistol. Yeah, about two years before it was even invented, pretty much. Yeah. Thank you, Marion. Now, she's better than the Marines. <laughs> yeah, she's awesome. This is such a brutal fist fight. And the sound effects are so great in this movie. I can't remember the name of the sound designer, but I think he may have won an Oscar for this movie. Yeah, I can't remember. But yeah, basically this movie was nominated for like seven Academy Awards. I think it won like four. All right, here's Marion going nuts. And the cool thing, see that red mist? Basically, Spielberg didn't want it to be like shooting blood like a geyser and stuff. He wanted it to be like a dusty mist, which looks great. I mean, that's probably pretty realistic. The only problem is because this movie was shot on the fly so much, 
the uh, the um, special effects guy didn't have long to uh, procure something that would look like a red dust. So basically, they would wrap the squibs and this powder, and when the squib would blow, that's when we see the dust, and it looks like bullets are hitting targets and stuff. So the problem is, though, the the um, guy used cayenne pepper as the red dust. So basically, they would shoot, the, they would film the scene, and then all this cayenne pepper dust would blow into the eyes of the uh, of the crew. And they were having a hell of a time. <laughs> Basically, they had cayenne pepper dust in their eyes the entire time they were shooting that. So they were not too happy. <laughs> and it's not like you can go take a shower. I mean, look at where they are. They're in the middle of Tunisia here. Gotta love this. And he just, motherfucker. But then, yeah. <laughs> Oof, this is still so brutal <laughs> oh my god horrifying i kind of feel bad because he was probably a decent guy <laughs> i know he's a nazi soldier but i mean he was like hey you know he fought indy fair and square but uh yeah oof it was like that it was like um if you guys ever saw the second expendables movie Oh, yeah. Don't want to be near that thing blowing up. <laughs> yeah, if you ever saw the second Expendables movie, um, uh, what's his name? Atkins? Scott Atkins actually gets uh, chopped up by a propeller, and it's fucking brutal. <laughs> yeah, I always remember that when I see this movie, because, I mean, it's just, oh, my God. Well, there, there's tons of accidents with propellers. I mean, you know. Like, basically, you'll be walking by the propeller and the engine will kick for whatever reason and the blade will just come down, you know, crack your skull in half. I mean, it's it's pretty scary. Pretty scary. Now we have a little dialogue here, like, what's going on? Okay, they loaded up, they loaded the Ark on a truck and got to go get it. Well, yeah, there they go. Like, all right, what are you going to do, Indy? I don't know. I'm making it up as we go along. <laughs> Love that. Oh, so the movie actually won five Oscars. That's cool. It was actually nominated for uh, Best Picture, of course. You know what? I want to see what movie beat this for Best Picture in 1981. You know, it's always kind of hard doing that because it's like, well, some years, I mean, the movies are just so great. I mean, it's like, shit, that is a tough call. Yeah. Now, here's this, uh, one of the greatest action scenes in movie history. I mean, look at this. Gets on a white horse. The camera work here is so great. The music, perfect. Like, oh, my God. Yeah, I mean, this, this is just such great heroic action adventure i mean this is just fantastic oh you know what i made a mistake i should be looking at 1982 the movie came out in 81 but it would have been up for yeah it would have been up for the oscars in 1982 okay the 54th Academy Awards. Let's we'll see. Yeah, that would have been scary as hell going down that on a horse. <laughs> yeah, there's an MG34. Those guys are like, knock it off, you fucking asshole. Guy, here's a great stunt. Not sure who did that stunt. I, I wouldn't be surprised if that was Vic Armstrong because he was doubling Harrison Ford. Yeah, this is such a great fight here. I mean, this is as hard. I mean, that's realistic, man. I mean, you imagine fighting a guy in the, you know, in the truck. Like, you have no room. This motherfucker's hitting the brakes so that they can surround you and kill you. And you're like, nope, we're going, motherfucker. 
Oh, <laughs> Van Hels. What is that called? The Wilhelm scream? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, these poor bastards. I'll tell them how long they've been working on that. I love this moment where they look at each other like, <laughs> that was cool. <laughs> and Indy, yeah, remembers who he is. Oh, yeah, he's like, I'm coming to get you, Belloc, you son of a bitch. You left me in that hole to die. Yeah, I just love this. I mean, this is a... God, I wish they still made movies like this, man. I know everybody, especially the young people nowadays. God, I, that makes me sound old. But you know what I mean. Like, people 25 and under, they love their CGI movies and stuff. But, I mean, this is real. And you can tell the difference. Like, this is fucking hot as hell and stuff. I mean, this is... But you have to remember, too, not every movie from this time period was good. I mean, it's this... These were the best filmmakers of the day working on this. Some of the best actors, some of the best filmmakers, some of the best writers, some of the best special effects, pretty much the best special effects people. Yeah, I don't know what the hell this motorcycle is thinking. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, I believe this character's name Gogol or Gogler or something. He was bas basically Dietrich's, yeah, that guy here is basically Dietrich's uh, right-hand man. That's the one special effect I have a problem with in this movie. I just do not like that. That just looks like fucking claymation. And first of all, where the hell are you going to find a canyon or a cliff like that in Egypt? <laughs> Like, I mean, do they even have that in northern Africa? Like, where the hell is that canyon? Maybe in the uh, Rift Valley somewhere? I don't know. But yeah, this is a... Oh my god. And basically, this inspired my favorite levels in the Uncharted games. Because, you know, the two great series of video games that are inspired by Indiana Jones are Tomb Raider and Uncharted. And I absolutely love Tomb Raider. Uh, Lara Croft is maybe maybe my favorite fictional female character of all time. I mean, I have to think about that. I mean, Ripley's great. And I mean, there's just some great fictional female characters. I mean, Leia is great. But um, yeah, I mean, Lara Croft, love her. And Uncharted games, I love them. The, you know, the scripts, the characters... The graphics, I mean, they're all great. It's just the gameplay I don't really like. It's very boring pl platforming and stuff. But what I do love is what I call the convoy missions. And basically in every Uncharted game, there's a mission like this where you're having vehicles and stuff. And God, here's a brutal fucking fight here. I'm not sure who this guy is. I'm sure he's probably some British. I mean, he looks like an old... Uh, old limey bastard <laughs> stuntman or whatever and god this is so brutal i'm sure mercedes loves being in a <laughs> sure mercedes love this oh yeah nazis yeah yeah, yeah we kind of want to forget about that part of our company's history i would i wouldn't be surprised if nowadays they wouldn't let the let that be done let that be shown in the movie <clears throat> oof yeah that would have been bad and I don't think Harrison Ford was used all that much in this, naturally. I mean, look at this. Jesus. So that was probably Vic Armstrong for the most part. God, talk about having some upper body strength <laughs> to hold on to that. But they did bring Harrison in here for the close-ups on the face so that you could tell it was him. Yeah, like right there. Ah, oh, this is a, such great filmmaking, man. But yeah, this uh, definitely inspired the Uncharted uh, convoy missions, like in Uncharted 1. Oh yeah, kick his ass, Indy. There was a pretty good little convoy mission. I think you are like on the back of a Jeep with a machine gun or something. And then the second one, I think you were like going, you were on like a train. You were just, yeah, riding on the train. And, well, I think there may have been a vehicle. Uh, uh, oh, that would be brutal. <laughs> yeah. Duh, I've never seen the body of somebody who was ran over by a truck, but probably don't want to either. <laughs> yeah. India is just so beaten up here. He's just like, motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, Belloc, I have the Ark now. Son of a bitch. But, um, yeah, my absolute, f well, I guess the second best convoy mission in Uncharted was definitely Uncharted 3, where it was kind of like this. You were on horseback, jumping from truck to truck. And I think in Uncharted 2, there was also maybe like a jumping truck, truck to truck or something. I don't know. I can't really remember. Uh, but uh, yeah, Uncharted 3 was definitely like this. You were in the Verbalkali and stuff, and uh, you were like attacking a convoy with some Bedouins and stuff. It was really, really fucking awesome. Uh, Uncharted 4, though, has the best convoy mission. I mean, that part in Madagascar is just so freaking awesome. <clears throat> I love this part where uh, Dietrich throws the melon at the dog. I'm sure that was added in uh, post. All right, so you want to know what won Best Picture in uh, this year over Raiders of the Lost Ark? Chariots of Fire. I never got to see it. I know it has a very famous soundtrack and stuff, and it's supposed to be a good movie. I think it's about British runners trying to beat the five-minute mile or four-minute mile or something. Yeah. Uh, the other nominations were Atlantic City, never even heard of that, on Golden Pond, never got to see that, and Reds, so, and, uh, so yeah, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Lost the Chariots of Fire, I'd like to see how that goes nowadays. Oh, Spielberg was actually nominated for Best Director, but Warren Beatty won for Reds. Yeah, Reds, huh? <laughs> hey, might be a good movie, I don't know. Um, saying if there's any actors or anything from this. No, 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 that's pretty much it. And uh, Raiders won for all the technical stuff, so yeah. I mean, that was the thing. Like, I think Star Wars, the first Star Wars movie, was nominated for like 11 Oscars or something. Maybe even like Best Picture. Yeah, I can't remember. And then, of course, won all the technical awards, so. All right, Sala, we'll see you in eight years, I believe, in uh, Last Crusade. Uh, Sala shows up in the books and stuff. I haven't really gotten to a book that has him in it, but I can't wait. Yeah, it's going to be fun reading Sala. This is, a, this is a nice little scene between the two of them. He's like, where the hell did you get this dress? <laughs> yeah, guys keep giving her like very expensive dresses. I guess that's like silk or something. I don't know. That looks nicer than silk. <laughs> Some like 1930s swag there. Oh my God. This is like the most painful moment in movie history. This always makes me just jump. Like, uh, oh my God. Okay. And he's just like rubbing his chin like, uh... No, that would have knocked you the fuck out. <laughs> I mean, that would have knocked you out, man. You would have been spitting up teeth from that. This, oh, my God. The humor in this movie, man, is just so great. And that's, you know, Lawrence Kazan, that's Spielberg, that's even Harrison and Lucas. Well, I don't know. Lucas, he doesn't seem that, uh, <laughs> he doesn't seem like he has that great of a sense of humor, but Spielberg and Harrison are pretty goofy guys on set. Like if you watch the, uh, behind the scenes stuff, I mean, they are just constantly doing stuff, which is kind of weird because Harrison in real life, I mean, he just seems like such a miserable fuck. <laughs> I mean, it's just like, I, it's kind of weird watching him on the, uh, on the set of Indiana Jones. I guess it's just because he's just having so much fun. I mean, well, who, who the hell wouldn't have fun on this? Like, I know it's a tough gig, but Jesus. And uh, his contract for uh, this movie was pretty good. Um, yeah, basically, Lucas didn't want to hire him just because he didn't want to be, he didn't want to have like a Scorsese De Niro relationship. Like, he didn't want Harrison to be his guy. Which I find kind of weird because I'm like, yeah, I mean, you guys work great together. Like, what's, I mean, if it ain't broke. <laughs> I mean, look at the movies that Scorsese and De Niro did together. I mean, my God, some of the best movies ever. 
Like, what, what would what would be your problem with that? And uh, Harrison was kind of like, I think he was kind of the same. Like, he was like, eh, you know. But, um, yeah, his contract was pretty good, though. Basically, it was a three-picture deal. If the first movie's successful, then they'll make the other two. And boy, oh boy, was this successful. This was made for about 18 to $20 million. And I think it made like $390 million. Like, <laughs> like I think um, on Wikipedia, it said if it's adjusted for inflation, this is like the 22nd highest grossing movie of all time. Or 22nd highest profitable movie of all time. I mean, it's just crazy. I mean, and the sequels weren't made for too much more. I mean, they were definitely able to keep costs down. Now, this uh, U-Boat was actually made for the, uh, I guess it was a TV miniseries, DOS Boot. I got to see DOS Boot like 10 years ago. It's actually really, really good. Yeah, it's probably in my top 10 favorite World War II movies. It was uh, done by Wolf, what was it, Wolfgang Peterson? Wolfgang Peterson, yeah. It's actually really, really good. But oddly enough, I think they actually, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark actually got to use the U-Boat before U5, um, U571, before DOS Boot did. So, yeah, they actually <laughs> kind of got to use it first. And I love how God didn't want a swastika on his chest. That was kind of, <laughs> that was kind of cool. Yeah. That definitely had to be a Spielberg idea, I believe. I don't even know where the hell they filmed this. I think this was probably on the French coast or somewhere. <laughs> I love how, I love that. I love Marion. She was just going to smack the fucking bejesus out of uh, Dietrich. <laughs> yeah, let's see. Yeah, this was made for $20 million and made $389 million. Which is holy shit money back then. Who plays Mr. Katanga? This guy looks familiar. Let me check him out real quick. Da -da -da. George Harris. What was this guy in? Oh, okay. Yeah, he was in Black Hawk Down. Okay. Yeah, he looked familiar. Oh, he was even in, in some of the Harry Potter movies. All right. He's actually not that old. Yeah, he was actually pretty young in this. He would have been uh, like 32 here. Yeah. So Raiders was made for 20 million. Let's see, how much was Temple of Doom? Because usually, you know, sequels can be like double. All right, yeah, yeah. A Temple of Doom was just made for $8 million more. Made 333 million. Probably because it was a bit darker. Yeah, that had to kind of hurt it. Well, wasn't that the movie that kind of spawned the PG-13 rating? I mean, I remember being a kid. My mom fucking hated Temple of Doom. Like the part where, uh, uh, what's his name, tears the guy's heart out. I mean, I was like fucking four or five years old. Now, the question I have here, where the hell's the hat? You know what? I just realized the hat doesn't show up until the end of the movie again. So... I guess he left it on uh, Katanga's ship. So, yeah, hold on to that for me. He'll get it back later. I love that scene, though. Yeah, he's just like running up on the boat, salutes him, and got the music going. It's beautiful. Now they're going to the Greek Isles. Now, Last Crusade was made for $48 million, which is more than double, but that was made eight years later. Yeah, so... And it made almost $100 million more. Uh, swastika. It really bothers me that they don't allow that to be shown anymore. I really hate whitewashing history. I really, really, really hate that. Because I guess they do it nowadays so they don't offend anybody. Like they took it out of video games. They took it out of movies. Like even history pages on social media have a hard time trying to show it. I'm like... Guys, that's a hateful symbol. It's supposed to be hateful and despised. Like, 
I mean, you go and play the original Medal of Honor game, which was interestingly enough, I think, okay, that was a close call there, <laughs> which I believe was actually produced by Spielberg or executive produced because it was made by DreamWorks and, you know, that's his company. Um, there's swastikas all over that game. And I remember being like a 10 year old kid shooting each swastika. <laughs> it's like, take that Nazis. I mean, it's supposed to be loathed and hated. I mean, they're the bad guys. Like show their fucking symbol. You yeah. know, I love this. <laughs> it's like, God damn it. Why did I have to be so buff in this movie? Guten Tag. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Look like a swine. Yeah, call me a hell. What does this shit? Shiza. <laughs> He's just like, all right. Yeah. Well, you have to remember Indiana Jones is a freaking pro by this time. I mean, this is like, what, a year after Temple of Doom. He's a World War One veteran. Um... I mean, he's gone on hundreds of adventures. I mean, Indiana Jones, this is this is probably him at his prime. Like, well, I don't know. Maybe not physical prime because he's getting beat up. I mean, he's he's pretty run down. It's like that scene with Mary and he's like, hey, it ain't the years, honey. It's the mileage. So, yeah, he's kind of he's kind of getting tired. Yeah. But I mean, Indiana Jones has killed hundreds of men by this time. And. You know, he's he's hardcore, yeah. He's tough. And Belloc here, you know, Belloc really wants... <laughs> forgot about that. He's like, yeah, take that. I mean, he does not miss a chance to fuck with Belloc, even though that was a little risky. I mean, Belloc, all he would have had to have done was like, hey, pardon, <laughs> you know. Interestingly enough, this is the same canyon from A New Hope. Basically, it's where R2-D2 got zapped by the Jawas. And I think it's also the same canyon where the Tusken Raiders were about to kill Luke and Obi-Wan shows up. Yeah. I guess that's why they filmed in Tunisia. It's cheaper than, uh, it's cheaper than Egypt. And, you know, Lucas has the familiarity there. He's been there and done that. You can kind of see... Uh, that guy probably shaved his head there. <laughs> Being bald, I can uh, I can spot the real thing. Yeah, these guys would have been carrying uh, MP35s, I think, or MP28s. They wouldn't have been packing MP40s. Oddly enough, I think you see MP28s in the Last Crusade near the end. Yeah, it's kind of kind of odd, but I mean, the MP40 is just so iconic for the Nazis. Now, this little contraption here, this is a RPG-2 sort of modified to look like a Panzer Shrek. Jones? I'm going to blow up the arc, Renee. This is a good scene. This is actually a very pivotal scene because this is basically where Indiana loses. I mean, this is where... Oh, yeah. See the fly? Yeah, that's pretty legendary. Now... That just shows how good of an actor Freeman is, but you could kind of make the point in real life, would he have been like, what the hell was that? <laughs> or, I mean, you could also argue, I mean, you got a guy pointing a RPG at you, and maybe you wouldn't really care about a fly flying in your mouth, so could kind of go either way there, but yeah. That just shows what a pro Freeman is. But yeah, I mean, Belloc's like, hey, calls his bluff, man. He's like, you want to blow it up? Blow it up. Send it back to God. But you know damn well you and I want to see what's inside there. Yeah. So it's kind of, you know, Indy loses here. Yeah. But I mean, it was a losing situation. I mean, what the hell is he going to do? I mean, kill all these guys and then what? Go back to the U-boat facility? <laughs> Skill, uh, steal a U-boat? I mean, what was he going to do? This was a desperate mission. And this, yeah, it's a great line. This is history, Indiana. And interestingly enough, I think the uh, U-boat uh, harbor that they used was actually a real-life U-boat facility from World War II. 
maybe that's uh maybe that's where they filmed in france yeah but uh yeah i mean indy loses yeah but hey <sighs> well <laughs> it's like the uh was it the christian saying and god we have already claimed the victory or something yeah god's the victor here and of course there's that whole thing where well if they had just, if Indy hadn't interfered and they had taken the Ark back to uh, Berlin and if they had opened this in front of Hitler, World War II never would have happened. But it's like, oh, come on. I mean, if Indy hadn't been here, this still would have happened and then the Ark would have just been left there. <laughs> so it's actually probably a good thing Indy was here. And oddly enough, I think uh, Belloc's um, Hebrew priest outfit is actually kind of accurate. As far as I know, like they definitely went all out. I don't know what's up with the club. Is that like supposed to be the uh, Lamb of God or something? Yeah, his staff? I don't know. Or is it a ram? I don't know. Yeah. But yeah, Belloc basically is so disappointed here. He's just like, you, I mean, and Dietrich's pissed off because, I mean, Dietrich is going to probably be lined up against a wall when he gets back to Berlin. <laughs> and he's just like, yeah, eat that shit sandwich. But yeah, Dietrich's like, man, they're going to, the SS are going to put me up against a wall <laughs> and shoot me when I get back to Berlin for this. This is such a great scene. I mean, it, I mean, it's dated, like, come on. I mean, this is 40 years old, but it's so fucking cool. Imagine seeing this in 1981 in the theater. This would have been, holy fucking shit. I mean, this would have been horrifying. I mean, that still looks good. I mean, the angel of death, I mean, that still sends a shiver down my spine because that is just so freaking creepy. Because, I mean, the angels, you know, you can't really tell what they are. Like, is this... Is this a woman? I mean, is this a woman's face? I mean, what is this? Is this like the love of God? Like, what is this? And then it just turns to the angel of death. And it's like, ah. <laughs> it's so terrifying. And then, oh yeah, this part where Indy tells her to close her eyes. I always wondered why or how Indy knew to do that. And the only thing I can think of is he remembers lot's wife from sodom and gomorrah you're not supposed to see god's wrath and you know uh lot's wife turned back and turned the salt you know she looked back and turned the salt and stuff and even every time moses went to the mountain to see god he came back looking old like you're not supposed to see this so uh there's that shot uh that's so horrifying <laughs> oh my god and now, <clears throat> so yeah, thankfully, I guess this instinctually, Indy knew we're not supposed to see this. And that's Belloc's failure. He's vain and, you know, he thinks this is for him. And he just catches on fire and kills all the Nazis. Yeah. It was always interesting watching this part with my grandfather, who is a World War II veteran. <laughs> like, all right. Oh, man. That... Tote melting is still like the most horrifying image I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, that is this. Oh my God. Basically, they took uh, molds of the actors and just melted them under like a heat lamp. And it took time. I mean, it took like a couple of minutes for that to happen. And then they just sped up the footage. Dietrich looks horrible. It basically looks like uh, my dick whenever I see Caitlyn Jenner. <laughs> just shrivels right up it's like yeah but tote i mean that's just oh my god that's horrifying and then of course they had to censor belloc's head exploding <laughs> so they added more flames to it that's so badass it's like all right did you enjoy my arc you sons of bitches <laughs> it's like god just put the smack down on the nazis yeah and poor marion and indy i mean they're just like oh <laughs> Imagine how tired they have to be. But yeah, thank God. Um, you know, it's kind of like the uh, part in Last Crusade, the penitent man will pass. Indy remembers, hey, 
It's like what Saul and uh, Marcus were trying to tell him. Be humble here. You're not supposed to see this. You're not supposed to mess with the ark. You know, some men, some, uh, some things men are not meant to disturb. Yeah. And that's Belloc's failure. He thought, oh, I know everything I can, you know, do, you know, I can handle it. And here we are again with the army intelligent guys. There's Porkins from Star Wars. That was so freaking, I lost my shit when I realized that was Porkins. I was like, what? <laughs> what an unflattering name for a character too. It's fitting, man. Man, yeah, this is a this is a great scene. It's so crazy to see Denim Elliot here, because he looks so much older in the Last Crusade. But I mean, that is like seven, eight years from now. So, eh. top men, and this is totally something they would do. Now, I think they filmed this at the San Francisco Town Hall. It's a very beautiful building. Uh, I think it would be shown a couple of years later in the James Bond movie, A uh, View to a Kill. A View to a Kill, excuse me. Yeah, she looks so good here. I love their outfits here, like his suit. God, I want that suit so bad. Gotta love those uh, London tailors, man. Nobody makes suits like they do. Double-breasted, love that. Her outfit is so cute. This is... He got his hat back. Yep, got his hat back. Well, hell, maybe Katanga was the one that came and rescued them from the island. Yeah, maybe they were able to get some uh, kraut radio and uh, figure out how to get in contact. This is such a great ambiguous ending. I just, yeah, that's such a classic ending. It's like, yeah, I mean, this is probably <laughs> what the government would have done because they don't believe in the Ark. They just think, you know, this is something Hitler wants and we're going to keep it from him. Now, I guess in uh, Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, this is Area 51, I guess. So, yeah. All right, guys, what a classic movie. God, I mean, the music is playing here. It's such a, and I guess that's a, um, I guess that's a uh, painting. I, I'm kind of forgetting what they were called. Uh, matte painting, yeah. And uh, this looks, what a great movie. And even um, Spielberg is like, you know, this is one of the few, the few movies that he's made that he can actually sit down and watch with his kids and actually forget that he made it. Like it's that good of a movie. Like he can just, you know, sit down and enjoy it. And that's pretty cool because i mean you have to remember how much hard work it is directing a movie <laughs> i mean you've got to remember all your shortcomings and all the mistakes you made and like damn it i should have done this or i should have done that but you know he's just able to sit back and watch it and enjoy it i mean and i think that that really states how just perfect this movie is i mean it's just a great action adventure movie it's like i said i mean i think it's a better movie than uh, Last Crusade, but I just love Last Crusade. Like, that movie is just... I just love the father-son dynamic, and the action scenes are great, and I love the tank stuff, and this, it's just... I just love it. It's my favorite Indiana Jones movie, but... God, I bet that doctor had her hands full <laughs> on, this, uh, on this movie. But, yeah, I mean, it's just... You can't go wrong with Raiders of the Lost Ark. I mean, it's just... Oh, they had a couple of doctors. I guess that was a Tunisian doctor. Industrial Light and Magic, motherfucker. Marin County. Yeah. They were the best, man. They were the best. But, um, yeah, I mean, just... God, they don't make movies like this. I would, I, I would love for them to, but, you know, movies just cost too much nowadays. I mean, if you wanted to make this now, it would cost $200 million. The studio would be up your ass. I mean, you wouldn't be able to end, you know, the way this, the Hollywood system is now. You can't shoot this quick and easy like they did with this movie. You know, shoot it fast and everything. Shoot it, shoot it on the fly. You just can't do that anymore. Everything has to be precise. Everything has to be, you know, we have to have a group discussion about it. It's just, you know. This would have to be like an independent movie nowadays, which is kind of funny. But, I mean, if you look back at movies, I mean, so many great movies were pretty much indie films. Like Dirty Harry, that was an independent film, pretty much. That was a B movie, you know. That was a, a low-budget movie, so. 
Yeah. Yeah, they even say Peruvian Hawaiian unit. All right, here's a cast. Harrison Ford. Great job. I mean, I, like I said, Tom Selleck, I think, would have been good. But, I mean, you can't take anything from uh, Harrison. I mean, this is, yeah. Yeah, Fred Sorensen was Jock. Okay, so, yeah, he's the pilot. Giant Sherpa. Oh, Pat Roach played the Giant Sherpa dude, too. Okay. Yeah, I got a couple of guys. Yep, Monkey Man, Big Tablian. Yep. George Harris, Katanga, yep. Stunts, Terry Leonard, yep. Vic Armstrong, yep. That's pretty much the uh, two best stuntmen right there, Terry Leonard and uh, Vic Armstrong. But yeah, guys, this is the uh, end of the movie, and uh, this is my first commentary, and I hope it went well. Hopefully the sound quality is okay. I won't know until I actually listen to it. <laughs> kind of scared now. But yeah, this was fun. And uh, thank you for joining me. I really enjoyed this and got to love this movie. So take it easy, guys, and uh, rock on. Hopefully we can do a Temple of Doom commentary one day. Guess that anniversary will be in three, four years.